Hello, everyone, and welcome to Heads Up, the weekly webcast and podcast of the National Headache Foundation. I'm Dr. Lindsay Weitzel, migraine strategist, founder of the Facebook group Migraine Nation, and chronic daily migraine survivor. I am here today with Dr. Tim Smith. Hello, Dr. Smith. How are you? I'm doing well, Lindsay. Thanks for having me on again. Thank you for being here. Usually when Dr. Smith is here, it means we have some really exciting information related to medications. Dr. Smith is the CEO of Study Metrics Research. He has a lot of background in clinical trials related to migraine medications, and he is also the vice president of the National Headache Foundation. So today we are going to talk about some new data that's out. It's a new study referred to as the Hermes trial where they looked at amavig or arenumab and they compared it to topiramate or topamax. And this is really important because it's sort of an older drug used for migraine compared to one of our newer medications. These medicines are very different. Uh, topiramate was not made to be used in migraine. It is an anti-seizure medication that actually helps many patients with migraine, whereas amavig was made to be used in patients with migraine and it works in the CGRP pathway. So Dr. Smith, let's just talk about how different these two medications are in their mechanism of action since they were compared in this trial. Sure, so uh, let's talk about topiramate uh, first. The most popular brand name is Topamax, although there are a couple of others out there like Trokendi and, uh, uh, and a couple of others. Uh, but uh, as you mentioned, it's an anti-epilepsy drug. Mm -hmm. It works on um, probably a couple of different channels to decrease overactive nerve pathways in the brain. You can think of it that way. Mm -hmm. That's kind of how it suppresses epilepsy, for example. Right. And it's also, you know, if you think about the, you know, migraine being partly, at least partly overactive nerve transmission through the trigeminal nerve. We talk about that one all the time, and that's the main migraine nerve that, that we think it innervates the face and part of the scalp, but it also uh, penetrates deeply and, and innervates um, the lining of the brain, the dura, we call it. And uh, so it's an important uh, neurological structure and treatment of migraine and topiramate suppresses activity on that uh, in that system. Mm -hmm. And it also suppresses other nerve you know, pathways, and it, it's kind of more of a general approach. So when you think about how that contrasts with uh, arenumab and the other CGRP monoclonals uh, or the other CGRP blockers, you can, you can think of it as, uh, you know, the Topamax is sort of the scattergun, and uh, the CGRP blockers are more of a laser, you know, kind of pinpoint target. Uh, the the uh, the most important, um, um, as we know it, the most important uh, chemical pathway that's responsible for migraine. I tell patients the CGRP. Uh, you know, when you block CGRP, you block most of the symptoms for most migraine patients, and that's mm -hmm. why we see the kind of results that we see and and uh, the low degree of side effects because you don't you know don't have that scatter you know the scatter uh, uh, gun approach. Uh, with the with the broader effectiveness. So um, for some people who don't respond to the arenumab or or you know the other uh, CGRP monoclonals, it may be that for whatever reason that CGRP is just not an important piece of their migraine. It is for most people, but there are some outliers that may not be. And uh, and for those people taking a broader approach may be actually better. Right. Uh, but you take a broader approach and sometimes you pay for that with side effects. And so, you know, if you, if you suppress the trigeminal nerve during, a, you know, to, you may suppress migraine, but if you suppress other areas of the brain, you may get you know, other, uh, you know, sem other uh, symptoms that you don't want, you know, if right. it makes you sleepy or if it interferes with your cognition so on and so forth. So that's kind of the way I think of it and the way I talk to patients about it. And I think that's a good way to kind of, just stick that in your back pocket so you can think about it that way. All right. I like that. The scatter versus the laser. That is a really interesting way to put it. I have never heard anyone say it like that, but that is a very great way to explain um, the difference in, in how these two medications come at the treatment of migraine. Um, why do you think it is really important that a trial has been done comparing these two medicines? 
because it's not just for the patients in our audience. It's there's this might be important to a lot of groups of people to hear. Right. I, you know, I, I'm, uh, patient groups obviously care about this. Individual patients care about it. I think doctors and care providers and caregivers, you know, want to know the these uh, these head to head results. Uh, maybe you know equally importantly is for for payers to get um, a look at this because right. when there's sort of a a, a rule uh, amongst uh, uh, in the scientific world and in the sciencey side of medicine, if we think about the art and science of medicine, on the science side of medicine, we're always discouraged. Uh, um, not to we we encourage people to not compare um, you know effectiveness results across different trials right. because you could be studying different populations you could have different um, inclusion exclusion criteria there may be different dosing schemes so if you don't study two products head to head in the same study it's hard to generalize the results from right. you know comparing one study to the next it's uh, where we discourage people from doing that. However, heretofore, that's all we've had. It's the only thing that we have been able to do for uh, these migraine medications because we haven't had any head-to-head -head well done, you know, uh, placebo-controlled, you know, randomized clinical trials, which is our gold standard. So with this trial, it's nice to have that uh, gold standard approach uh, utilized. Mm -hmm. And I think that gives us some very good data that we can uh, that we can uh, apply uh, with confidence because we know that that statistical rigor is there. Right. Um, so in the Hermes study, how did the two medications compare when it came to side effects and tolerability? So with, the, with respect to tolerability, one of the best markers for that is uh, how many patients discontinued right. the treatment from each side. And when you look at the six month trial, uh, and by the way, this it was a double blind study and people say, well, how can you have a double blind study when you're given pills versus a shot? And they used a technique called double dummy uh, technique so that all the patients got a shot and a pill. So they had to take a once a month shot, which uh, could be placebo with an active uh, top topiramate pill or vice versa. They get the active shot and then they get topiramate placebo. Uh, so, mm -hmm. you, and, and they're blinded and the investigators are blinded. So nobody knows what they're getting. And then you let the, you know, let the, the chips fall where they may and let the data tell the story when it's all said and done. Right. So that, and, and they did that for six months and this was a large study. And uh, when we look at uh, the dropout rates uh, due to uh, adverse events, uh, it was just a 10.6% uh, of the Arenumab group uh, dropped out and 38.9, uh, almost 40% of the topiramate group couldn't make it to six months right. on that. And, and we know that that sort of uh, mirrors some of the data that we've seen from uh, not clinical trials, but from claims data from people get not fulfilling their topiramate prescription out right. past six months. It's, it's very common for people to drop off of it. But the problem we have with those data is we don't know if it's because of side effects or because they couldn't afford it or because it wasn't working well. Right. With this trial, we actually measured all the outcomes and we could capture the reasons why they were stopping. And that's, that's the other beautiful thing of doing a randomized clinic, you know, controlled trial right. so that you have these people uh, completing diaries and answering questionnaires and we can understand, you know, what's going on a little better. Okay. So as far as tolerability, it, it looks like that in this study, uh, Amabig was found to be a bit more tolerable than topiramate. Um, so when it comes to efficacy, how did that data play out? So the best marker that we look at for efficacy is a 50% responder rate. That's, you know, how many people, what right. percentage of the, of the study population had a 50% response rate or better. That is their migraine days reduced by 50% or more. So this would be a patient who started out with 12 migraine days uh, goes to six or, or better. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so we know that there's, there are some super responders that get even better than that. Right. But if you look at that 50% responder rate, which is kind of our, our, our benchmark for, for most of these, uh, for most of the trials we look at, 
the that number for arenumab was 55.4. So these patients had um, uh, 50 percent. Over half the patients had a 50 percent response rate. Uh, and when you looked at the topiramate uh, arm, it was 31 percent. So um, it was about a 25 point difference between the arenumab and the topiramate uh, favoring arenumab. So. Uh, that just uh, you know goes to show you it's you know the take home points being it's better tolerated okay. people stay on it longer they get a better result from it okay. and uh, quit rate is less but we also know that part of the quit rate is not just better effectiveness for the arenumab but more side effects for the topiramate on right that sort of goes along with what we talked about earlier on the the you know the scatter gun approach versus the laser beam approach and so the laser just to targets the the receptor or the ligand, in this case, the receptor we want to get, and the topiramate uh, tends to target a broader array of uh, um, neural, neuronal channels. Right, and I think we should point out that these people that were enrolled in this study had at least four migraine days a month, am I correct? Yeah, yeah. Okay. and that's, that's the, what we call prevention eligible. We don't even start thinking about prevention until people have at least four migraine attacks per month, uh, days per month. Uh, sometimes if they have really strongly disabling headaches, we consider prevention even earlier, even with few, fewer than four days per month, but, okay. but uh, just an arbitrary number, that's where we start thinking about that. Okay, so there's a really big point that I want to make here. Um, this doesn't mean there's no role for Topamax. I don't want it to seem like this study was bashing Topamax or anything like that. So do you still think that there's a role um, for people with migraine, there's a role for Topiramate or Topamax? Oh, definitely. I, you yeah. know, we've used Topiramate for decades now and, it, and it, uh, it's one of the most studied medications in migraine prevention and, um, you know, uh, there is a, a definite population of patients that uh, you can get to the right dose with good mm -hmm. effectiveness. Uh, you know, in this study, they tar targeted a, a 50 to 100 milligrams. Um, you know, in, back in the, you know, 20 years ago, we targeted 100 to 200 milligrams. So we were using much higher doses, seemed mm -hmm. like back in the day, but it seems like people are settling into that a uh, little bit of a lower dosage range, the 50 to 100 milligrams is sort of being ideal. And for a fact, once you go past that, you start in increasing side effects. Mm -hmm. uh, nothing dangerous necessarily, but uh, you just have to work with the patients. And that's the other big difference between the more modern therapies is that, you know, when when I, you know, we worked in, in the headache clinic 20, 25 years ago, uh, these were really long appointments with lots of discussions about what you've tried before, what kind of side effects you've had, what dosage you've been on and how long you've been on it and how did you combine drugs and did you get any partial relief to this one or that one and you know it was it was a much more uh, challenging office visit because right. patients you know you had to individualize that care a lot more right. you know and, and with the CGRP drugs for example now it's sort of like if you haven't tried it you need to try it if you right. can, you know, and uh, the insurance payers are saying, you know, you have to fail a couple of the right. oral generics first, including topiramate, and uh, I think this study kind of helped speak to, I, I believe these numbers are, are, are fairly believable. Uh, the study was well done. It kind of reflects what we think we see in clinical practice, a higher degree of, of side effects, and, uh, you know, 80 something percent of people on topiramate had side effects in this study. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and, and almost 40 percent of them discontinued before the six months was over. So that that's uh, not uncommon in, in clinical practice as well. So uh, I'm glad we have a double blind placebo controlled study that uh, that points out these differences between these treatments. I think this study is hugely important for multiple reasons, but one thing I want to make sure we get across is if you are someone who found that maybe you didn't respond to Amovig or any other uh, MAB, or you couldn't take it for some reason, I don't want people to think there's not other medications to go back and take uh, if you if you haven't tried uh, topiramate or something. So I didn't want... Um, 
this this episode or this data to be interpreted in that way. Um, I just want to make sure because there are many migraine patients who have found relief and are stable um, on topiramate. Um, so I wanted to make sure we got that point across too. But how do you think this data should be used? You sort of brushed on this a little bit. You were saying that um, people are sort of being told that they have to try some less effective medicines, older medicines, medicines not made for migraine before they can try a, a MAB or, or something like aim of egg. Do you think there's a role for this data to help us get past that hurdle? Well, I hope it, it's helpful. It's instructive. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the, the thing is, is there's this whole uh, concept nowadays of non-medical switching that right. uh, we call it. And patients are, are being asked to take medications, not for medical reasons, but because of cost and other concerns. And I don't want to minimize cost, you know, at all. I mean, it's very important. You know, newer medicines are always more expensive. Right. And it's not uncommon for uh, payers to uh, really try to steer patients into more cheaper alternatives and uh, with the thinking that if they work and people tolerate them, then, you know, they can have good quality of life and, um, you know, not, not have to uh, spend the money on the, on the higher end therapies. So, uh, you know, I, my little soapbox on it is I, I wish we lived in the world where uh, patients could partner with their physicians who know what their history yeah. is, know how much they're disabled, know what same things they've tried before, and know who would be a good candidate for one or the others. You know, mm -hmm. we we most patients trust their physicians, especially if they have a, a physician that they they've known for a while who cares about them, and will partner with them on making their care decisions. They really are you know disappoint are disappointed and don't like. Um, a non-medical, you know, person right. stepping in and putting non-medical requirements on them to right. try their medications. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, the, it's the world we live in, and it's it's really pred predicated on the economics of things. And uh, you know, it's a reality we have to live with. I, I don't want to be naive or or uh, silly about it. You know, it's 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 real world, and it's what we have to deal with. But in that instance, to have a, a, a really well done study, this was done in Germany, by the way, mm -hmm. and uh, the, the researchers are all high quality experienced researchers. They've done a lot of migraine work and there uh, two or three of them on the paper are very well known and respected uh, researchers and headache uh, clinicians. So it's not just an American thing. You know, this is a, a problem the world over and, and our, our patients really, really wanna know uh, they would love to have data that their clinicians can take back and make a case for, you know, the recommendations that they right. make. And, and I, I'm super happy to have this study and I hope it, uh, you know, makes a difference for patients in their lives. All right. Well, thank you so much. Is there anything else you would like to add about this data comparing uh, Amavig and Topiramate before we go? Well, I, you know, I just, I hope we'll see some other information. Uh, I, hope, I hope other study groups will put together high quality studies to help us look at some of these because there are so many treatments now and none of them have been studied against one another. Mm -hmm. And it's, and it's um, people want to know which ones are best, which ones right. do people tolerate better. And it's good to have new treatments. It's good to have lots of options nowadays, but uh, to have better comparative sort of effectiveness uh, numbers to look at is uh, that's always a good thing. You know, mm -hmm. we just need it to be well done and, and, and well documented and well publicized. So I thank you for, you know, using your platform to kind of get this information out about it. Uh, you always do great things for uh, the migraine world and uh, I'm always thank happy you. to be of, of help. Well, thank you for being here and for giving us your time and your expertise. And thank you everyone for joining us today. And please join us again next week on the weekly webcast and podcast of the National Headache Foundation. Everyone have a good night.